Got some more fan art here. Thank you guys so much. This is some of my favorite. Sometimes people feel outclassed by really good artists. I know because I feel outclassed by really good artists. But the fact that you guys are drawing it for me at all means a lot to me. So thanks again. Also, subscribe to my second channel, Telltale Science. I'm about to do a video on the Big Bang Theory and how we know it happened the way it did. So check that out on Tuesday. So today I'm going to talk about a group I haven't mentioned before, Christian Science. It probably isn't what you think it is. It's a full-blown religion and it gets crazy. Let's get into it. Christian Science was founded by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy in the late 1800s, just like Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists, and the Millerite movement, from which they sprung in the mid-1840s, not to mention Mormons, who were kind of founded in the 1830s. Apparently, the 1800s were a popular time for up-and-coming cults. It was the fastest-growing religion in the U.S. in 1936, with about 270,000 members, but by 1990, that number had dropped to around 100,000. We'll see the reasons for that in a minute. For context, Jehovah's Witnesses have about 8 million active members, and Mormons have 14 million. So that's really small, considering. Anyways, Mary Baker Eddy lived from 1821 to 1910. She believed that sickness is an illusion that can be corrected by prayer alone. If you pray for health and you aren't cured, then your faith wasn't strong enough. She proposed that in a book she wrote in 1875 called Science and Health. I'm sure you all can see where this is going. This is kind of their main thing, never taking medical treatment under any circumstances. But I've been saying this about them for years. They're going to be the last ones standing. Evolution is significantly slowed on the rest of us. Natural selection and sexual selection don't have as much of a chance to operate on us as it once did. The internet makes it much easier for anybody alive nowadays to find a mate, no matter what problems they have. So there goes sexual selection. And with modern medicine, natural selection doesn't apply as heavily as it used to. Nature's bad designs aren't dying off quicker than nature's good designs. They're living about the same amount of time in many cases. There is a slight decrease, so natural selection does still apply, but not like it did 500 years ago, or even 100 years ago. But Christian scientists over here aren't accepting medical treatment at all. Natural selection is acting on that community in full force. They'll be the first to develop a natural immunity to some major disease, I'm sure of it. In our case, the artificial selection of medical treatment is acting on us more heavily than natural selection. In the end though, if we were threatened with a serious disease, natural selection would apply anyways. So they're just killing themselves off needlessly right now. So let's take a look at their tenets, straight from their website. There are six of them. One, as adherents of truth, we take the inspired word of the Bible as our sufficient guide to eternal life. Okay, nothing excessively strange about this one. Pretty standard Christian stuff. Two, we acknowledge and adore one supreme and infinite God. We acknowledge his son, one Christ, the Holy Ghost or divine comforter, and man in God's image and likeness. This one is kind of interesting because I thought it was talking about the Trinity at first, but it turns out that they think that God is the only thing that actually exists. Everything else is an illusion, which is why they think they can pray sickness away if their faith is strong enough. Three, we acknowledge God's forgiveness of sin in the destruction of sin and the spiritual understanding that casts out evil as unreal. But the belief in sin is punished so long as the belief lasts. What does that mean? The destruction of sin and the spiritual understanding that casts out evil is unreal? What? 4. We acknowledge Jesus' atonement as the evidence of divine, efficacious love, unfolding man's unity with God through Christ Jesus, the way shower. And we acknowledge that man is saved through Christ, through truth, life, and love, as demonstrated by the Galilean prophet in healing the sick and overcoming sin and death. Okay, what is this garbage? This is just meaningless nonsense. Does it actually mean anything at all? Let's break it down word by word. So they're saying they accept Jesus' death as evidence that God loves them. Then it says, unfolding man's unity with God through Christ Jesus the way shower. Is that word salad? That feels like word salad. Then it says, they accept Jesus' death saved us. Then there's more word salad. Through truth, life, and love as demonstrated by the Galilean prophet in healing the sick and overcoming sin and death. I guess I can take that to mean Jesus saved us and that was demonstrated by Jesus healing the sick and coming back to life. It really just sounds like a bunch of garbage to me. Five, 
We acknowledge that the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection served to uplift faith to understand eternal life, even the allness of soul, spirit, and the nothingness of matter. So it's saying they accept that Jesus' death and resurrection built faith in people to understand eternal life, and then more word salad. You know, this is another marker of a cult that wasn't on my checklist. Specific language that means something to the adherents of the faith. Jehovah's Witnesses have things like disfellowshipped, or worldly people, or Jehovah, or they'll have specific beliefs that are unique to them, to separate themselves from everybody else, like believing that Jesus died on a stake instead of a cross. There's no telling if that's true or not. They just pulled it right out of their ass and ran with it, because it makes them different, and they want their members to feel different from everybody else. That's part of the cult mentality. Six and we solemnly promise to watch and pray for that mind to be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, and to be merciful, just, and pure. Okay, this one isn't as word salad They promise to pray for that mind to be in them, which is also in Jesus. They say that because they believe that God is everything and all matter is an illusion. And then they say we should treat others how we want to be treated. Wow, that was a bunch of bullshit. It was really fucking hard to get reliable information on these guys. They basically have a website and a YouTube channel, and that's about all the information I could find about them because they're so small. There don't appear to be many activist groups led by ex-members or anything, but there are some activists, one of which I'm going to shout out. XChristianScience.com seems to be a really good website dedicated to shining a light on it. I'm glad it's around. I only wish they got more exposure. I mean, they only had 100,000 members 30 years ago. That number has to be smaller by now. I can't even find an accurate figure for current numbers. That's saying something. That being said, I want to mention some court cases involving Christian scientists. 1984, Sacramento, California. A Christian scientist named Lori Walker's four-year-old daughter was sick with flu-like symptoms, and instead of bringing her to a doctor, they had a healing practitioner come pray over the kid. The daughter, Shantae, died on March 9th, 1984, 17 days after symptoms started appearing. It was meningitis, easily treated if diagnosed early. But there was a 1976 law that protects parents from misdemeanor child neglect charges for praying instead of bringing them to a hospital. In this case, though, it was a manslaughter charge because the kid died, which is a felony. An article about the case says the practitioner, meaning the person who prays for sick people, refused to give a statement, claiming some sort of a privilege, but she said she gave spiritual guidance to the child. The police officer handling the investigation, Sergeant Bob Burns, said, The church people aren't being very cooperative. There are hundreds of cases like this, dare I say thousands. The church spokesman, Nathan Talbot, said there were more than 50,000 documented success cases of spiritual healing. I'm calling bullshit. Let's see the documentation if there's so much of it. That documentation never did turn up. When another kid died in Massachusetts in 1986, Talbot said, more than 700 Massachusetts children died while under medical care, but no one would dream of suing those parents or doctors. This just shows a shocking lack of self-awareness and a very clear streak of extremism. Now I wanna compare them to the cult checklist. Let's take a look. One. Do they have language that has special meaning to the members? I changed the order a little bit to put this one at the top of the list because they are really bad about this one. Just look at their tenets. It's ridiculous. I've been trying to read through their website and having genuine trouble getting through it. I have to keep going back and reading the same bits over and over because they're just using word salad all the way through it. It's the kind of thing only members can understand. Two, do they proselytize? They do, but not as heavily as other churches. They have a really elaborate, nice, expensive website with all their stuff on there. I was actually surprised by how big and robust it was considering you don't meet many Christian scientists, at least not where I live. So I'm actually gonna give them a pass on this one because there are worse ones. Three, do they perform uncommon or unique rituals? When I wrote this one, my intent was to see if they had any kind of mind-numbing rituals that would put people into a mesmerized state, like saying Hail Mary prayers over and over again, or studying magazines, repetitive rituals. As far as I can tell, they do, at the very least, study the Christian Science Bible and Mary Baker Eddy's and the Church of Christian Science's literature every day. I'd say that would qualify. Four, are they heavily guilted? They are very heavily guilted into certain things, like not taking medical treatment, for example. If they don't heal through prayer, they're told they don't have enough faith, even stage four cancer. The most intense illness must be cured with prayer instead of medical treatment. I volunteered to help uh, train people to run marathons at the local high school. And one particular morning, I arrived early and was doing my warm up. 
when I found a tennis ball on the track and I decided to uh, dribble with the tennis ball, I lost my focus and I stepped on top of the tennis ball and rolled over on my ankle. Uh, I was able to hop back to my car and drive home, uh, praying all the time, trying to realize that I would have everything that I needed and that I'd have the proper spiritual ideas to support me in this challenge. Uh, when I arrived home, I was able to uh, get into my house and I immediately called a Christian Science practitioner and I looked down at my foot and it was not in alignment where it should have been normally and there was a protruding bump on the side of my foot and in talking to the practitioner during that three minute call I actually witnessed the um, bump and my foot align back where it should have been originally. These people are like faith healers. It's complete delusion at this point. When Richard Dawkins wrote his book, The God Delusion, he received letters from psychologists saying, he received letters from psychologists telling him he should come up with a different term other than delusion, because that's a real medical term. A lot of them suggested a new word, relusion. Here's the definition of delusion, an idiosyncratic belief or impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is generally accepted as reality or rational argument, typically a symptom of mental disorder. It's that bit at the end about it typically being a symptom of a mental disorder, but I'd still call it a delusion in this case. Here's a woman talking about how her identity theft was fixed with prayer. I got a phone call from a collection agent who said I had a phone bill from New York City of $2,300 which was ridiculous. I had never lived in New York City. I visited three or four days at a time, never even had time to make a phone call. Uh, but here this man was insisting, and he had so much information on me. My name, my social security number, my addresses, my last address. He just had so much information that it seemed to be that he could define me by all that information and therefore conclude that I owed this bill. Well, that night, I had a very extreme pain more than I've ever felt in my life, and actually let's call it a discomfort, uh, very uncomfortable. And it came to me so clear that I'm not a matter body, I'm an idea of spirit, God. And the pain instantly left. The next um, suggestion that came in my thought was a charley horse in the back of my leg, and I stood up and I said, I am entirely the spiritual idea of God. And in that moment, that was gone. So the whole thing, those three temptations occurred in very short time. And it was such a proof that every time an idea or suggestion comes of pain, discomfort, it's identity theft. It's not our true identity. The only place we find our true identity is in an understanding of God, which the Bible teaches us and which the Christian Science textbook teaches us, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. That's where our identity is. And in proportion, as we know our true identity by knowing who God is, in that proportion, we're freed from all limitations, whether it's physical, financial, emotional, um, companionship, all of it. All of it is, is redeemed through an understanding of God. That definitely feels like delusion to me. Okay, moving on. Five, do they shun? Yes, they do shun. If a member decides to take medical treatment or something, they're pushed out of the community. And the sickest part is that they force it on their kids. They won't get their children medical treatment at all. They'll just pray for them. And if they die, they'll just know their faith wasn't strong enough. Six, do they bend the truth in the church's favor? They definitely do. Just looking at some of these clips on YouTube, these people are talking about how prayer healed their foot or their knee or solved their identity theft or cured their skin problem. It's all outrageous and disgusting to me. And in this case, I'm lumping these stories in with number seven, which is, do they practice theocratic warfare? I'm gonna say yes. They lie and manipulate in service of the cause, as we heard about earlier with their lack of cooperation with anybody in a criminal case. That isn't even close to the only case, either. 8. Do they control information flow to members? It's hard to tell because there's so little reliable information on them, but they've already been proven to be extremists. This usually comes with the territory, so I'm assuming they do. I can't call it based on the list, but I'm calling it a cult based on their outlandish and extremist practices and beliefs. They're a cult. Like I said earlier, I just hope they get more exposure. They're basically doing whatever they want because they have so few members right now. Nobody's paying attention. It isn't worth the mainstream broadcast to talk about it. So I'll talk about it here. Good luck, guys. I hope we can bring it down together. That's all I've got for you for now. Follow my new channel, Telltale Science, and follow me on Twitter, Patreon, and Discord. Thanks for watching, guys.